of uh, people who are primarily uninsured, but we also um, have been taking Medicaid clients as well, um, and because of reasons that you guys heard earlier. Um, what we do with Medicaid clients is actually act as a triage for Francis Nelson uh, for the more critical <coughs> issues or problems that people have. We go and get them um, into Francis Nelson because we have referral slots with them. Um, something I'd like to highlight um, that might have not have been covered um, that's critical for our particular area, and some of this kind of information comes from uh, Andrea over at Francis Nelson. Um, part of it is that we have a very high uninsured population as opposed to some other communities. And what that does is puts a greater strain on even Francis Nelson that gets enhanced Medicare reimbursement rates. Um, we, if you look at Anvil Decatur, they get about 70% um, Medicaid clients and 30% uninsured, and it's put flat for Francis Nelson. Um, so even with a larger facility, uh, you still gonna have a very high proportion of clients who try to think, you know, can't pay for much of their, much of their care. Uh, so that's one thing to consider. There's different, you know, hypotheses of why we have such a high uninsured population. Uh, you can look at the migrant worker situation. You can look at the fact that we're a university town. Um, you also have the fact that we're a crossroads for three major cities, and right, right now, 57. You can have come up with all different reasons, but for whatever reason or another, we're a very mobile community. Uh, Francis Nelson stores away their medical files every three years, and really have to go back and get a file and find. So we're very like a revolving door kind of community. Um, that promotes the fact that you consider most people are insured with their employers. That promotes the fact that most of them are not going to be employed or uh, have insurance through employers because of the mobility of their factor. Um, so you got a lot of issues like that. Some other critical issues is that 68% uh, of the bankruptcies in Champaign County are due to medical debt. Um, so we have a lot of people, and it's likely that we get, get at the clinic, um, who have outstanding balances at the local providers um, because they can't afford to pay their bills. So um, you know we, we're, we're one of the last places they can go. Um, in terms of types of clients we have, um, you, you name it, we see a little bit of everybody. It can be a graduating college student who no longer has their parents' insurance. It could be a, a mother who recently been divorced and have no health care anymore. Um, guys coming out fresh out of prison with a bus ticket and $20 to their name. So um, you pretty much name it, we, we've seen it at our, our clinic. Um, and I suspect that what we see is obviously just a tiny fraction of what's actually out there. Um, so those are some of the critical things that have been, been covered that uh, we kind of encounter at the Champaign County Christian Health Center. Um, so I'm encouraged by this, this gathering and hope to see some good things come out of it. Thank you. I just wanted to comment that just so people know, the statistic that we use when Charlene was giving the numbers of how we estimate the uninsured in Champaign County, we use 13%. I think most of us who are working directly you know, in the community with people think that that's actually um, a very conservative uh, number. It's probably a, an underestimate. And I don't know if, um, if you guys have specific numbers that you've found, but I just wanted to let people know that 13% is probably low volume. We uh, conducted a survey right before we opened, and um, it was primarily with the African American community, and we found that about 45% of 200 surveys uh, were people who didn't have any health insurance. Um, so, yeah, I, I would also venture to say that it's probably more than that. Thank you very much. Um, did, did you want to pass around your... We know much of the information was already in the... Oh, okay. Stuff, so, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, and now, uh, Stephanie Karachi from Provena Covenant Medical Center, and we're passing around some information that she put together. Hi, everyone. Again, I'm Stephanie Karachi, the hospital liaison for Provena. Um, there she is. This way. Here we go. Um, I am probably not the person if you have additional questions um, to ask, but please feel free to uh, come up to me afterwards um, just to touch base and find out how you can uh, get more information from some of the experts. They'd be more than happy to help. Um, just to go over, these graphs are very self-explanatory, um, but just to touch base, um, I'd like to focus on the top graph. It's the Illinois Public Aid Visits um, for 2003 until the present. Um, if you just add up all the numbers for all the months and average it all out, for 2003, um, emergency department visits were about 500 patients a month for um, Illinois Public Aid Visits. In 2004, it was about 575 patients a month, um, which is a 15% increase from the previous year. And then in 2005, uh, it jumped from 575 patients a month to about 744 patients a month. And that's only um, numbers up until September. We don't have the most recent numbers out quite yet. 
So from 2003 to 2005, that's a 48% increase in emergency department visits. So the numbers in and of itself pre speak pretty loudly. Um, this is just Provino Covenant, right? Um, and so a lot of this is because of the um, ailments that we're seeing in emergency department visits. They're preventable ailments. These are people who have um, colds that turn into pneumonia. Um, they have basic oral surgery problems that turn into major pain um, that they have to see the emergency department for because they can't get proper dental care. Um, chronic illnesses, diabetes, asthma, high blood pressure, things that need to be followed up and cared for um, with primary care providers. People don't have access to them, so they're coming to the emergency department, which is obviously problematic and is terrible for the community for several reasons. Um, it's not cost effective for the patient or the hospital. Um, from a hospital's point of view, um, the increase in emergency department visits um, escalates overhead um, because we, we know that the reimbursement rate isn't going to be the best. It's going to be next to nothing. And it continues to add to the ever-increasing cost to provide quality health care. Quality health care is very important. Um, and further placing the burden on paying and or insured uh, patients. So if you also think about all these people who are coming to the emergency department for preventable illnesses, if someone does come to the emergency department that truly needs care, they have serious injury, um, something's very problematic, you've got doctors who are being tied up with people who might not necessarily need to be there. So it, it creates several backlogs and bottlenecks the system as well. So um, emergency departments can also not provide follow-up care. Emergency on-call doctors aren't able to follow up with these patients that they just saw to make sure that they are taking care of their high blood pressure or their cold or that they are taking their antibiotics or anything along those lines. So it does become problematic. Um, thank you, Stephanie. One thing that we had um, talked about is the, um, the increase in the numbers of visits um, during this time that um, Stephanie was talking about. There hasn't been an increase, there has not been a similar increase in the number of admissions. And that's part of how the hospital knows that these are folks who are essentially needing to use the emergency department um, because they have no place else to go and they're essentially seeking, you know, um, primary care kinds of services. And um, Carl isn't here, Carl Foundation Hospital is not here to present, I don't think, is anybody here from Carl Foundation Hospital? Um, but we've met with them and they have, I don't know what their numbers are, but they have said the similar things, the similar things, that they're seeing increases through their emergency department and it's not coupled with increases in admissions. So it's sort of the same pattern. Jeff, did you I'd just like to add too, Francis Nelson's visits went from 14,300 in 2001 to 19,800 in 2004. Mm -hmm. So you can see how that's played in. Yeah. And I know, um, and many of you work in a, in a capacity where you have to end up referring clients to the emergency department. I know that happens through um, healthcare consumers. We talk to people, and it's like Stephanie said, um, people who are, um, you know, who have a chronic oral health infection because they're not able to get the oral surgery to have the tooth removed that needs to come out. Um, the, the oral surgeons in this community are located at the clinics. Um, you know, there are people going there um, when they are having high blood pressure. Uh, and just, you know, things like that. We're constantly having to refer people um, because they just don't have a medical home where these kinds of things would be taken care of, you know, fairly easily and, and quickly. And, um, of course, these folks are suffering along the way as well. Um, so thank you very much. I appreciate um, the speakers sticking to the time frame. Um, so I think uh, I'm ready to turn it over to Val McWilliams, who's going to introduce uh, Thomas Yates and then Afterwards, we can um, talk more and ask questions, and, and I'm sure that the other folks who have spoken as well will be willing to, to have you ask questions as well. Well, um, it's my pleasure to introduce Tom. Actually, this morning, I need to stand up for this so you can see it. I was cleaning out a um, bookshelf because uh, some other staff members are going to be moving into our office next week, so they, we've been moving some stuff around. And I found uh, this document, which is pretty old, is Medical Assistance Programs Administered by the Illinois Department of Public Aid. It's getting so old, the pages are starting to stick together. Um, but this was written by Thomas Yates of the Legal Assistance Foundation of Chicago at the time. 
and it was, it's, it's pretty old. This is the update, uh, but 92, yeah. So, so anyway, he's been a Medicaid expert for a long time, and it was my responsibility at about the same time to set up a Medicaid training for legal services attorneys in our program. Um, I invited two people to participate to be the trainers for that. One was somebody from the National Health Law Program in California. The other one was Tom Shields from uh, Chicago. Uh, so he truly is an expert, uh, a national expert in these issues, and it's our privilege to have him here today uh, where he can uh, share uh, his insights specifically with the class action that he's been involved with for children who are Medicaid recipients, and then also generally his thoughts about uh, the subject area. He graduated from the University of Iowa College of Law in 1983, which means he's been doing this kind of work for about 22 years, I think is the mathematical calculation there. Uh, and pretty much that whole time, he's been specializing in Medicaid and Social Security related issues. So, thank you very much for coming today. My mother always wanted me to get a real job. Failure <laughs> <laughs> um, and you know, thanks for having me down. I'm delighted to come. Um, I'm going to talk about this lawsuit. I'm going to talk about a few other things that I think about when I look, when I look at these problems as well. If you have questions, why don't you just ask them what's going on. Um, if it's too big a problem, maybe we'll hold them. But I would rather have a conversation with you, you all here, as opposed to just having you listen to me talk about some case up in Cook County. Okay? Um, but I will start talking about the case of what it, what it was about and what's happened so far. Um, I used to be, I used to work at a um, legal services clinic on the south side of the city at 63rd and Halstead in the Englewood neighborhood with another attorney named Stephanie Altman, who's also a lawyer on this case. And we had, just to show you how different it is from Champaign County, we actually had an office above a Medicaid room where <coughs> The guy who ran it was in and out of jail for Medicaid prescription fraud. Um, there were people coming in. They had no appointments. You came in. You took a number. You were seen. They ran a pharmacy in the place. And because we were on the second floor and not accessible, we used to go down and interview our clients who couldn't get up these really steep steps that we had um, in their clinic rooms. Um, so we had a pretty good idea of what, what was going on there. And we knew from talking to people that that was pretty much how folks on Medicaid, at least in the south side, where we were at that point, got their health care. Um, that they didn't have regular doctors like I had for my kids, um, or that I had for myself. Um, and when we talked to people, it seemed very quickly, at least in Chicago, that it was very difficult to find, many people had real difficulty finding a regular doctor. Um, although it was an urban setting, I think a little different than Champaign, maybe not, I don't know. But, um, and so we thought that we ought to do something about that. Um, and the other thing that we knew when we talked to our clients, and we were focusing at that point on pregnant women and kids, and I'll tell you why in a second, is that when we talked to our clients, very few of their kids would get preventive health care services. They didn't get well child visits, they didn't get lead blood screens, which where we were in the city was a huge problem because the housing stock was so old, it all had a lot of pain in it. You know, we'd see these kids that come in because I do Social Security Disability on the side, and I'd have these kids come in at ages four and five with IQs in the 50s who'd been exposed to lead. Um, and that was not an uncommon thing. And we knew that, at least in the city, that doctors didn't do lead blood screens, particularly. Um, kids didn't get well screens. Um, they didn't get immunizations. And in fact, that's the way it is today. I mean, a lot of kids who have doctors, when they go to the doctors for their shots, they say, we don't do shots. If you don't get paid enough, you're going to have to go down to a city or a county clinic and get the shots or go to school before school starts and you can get your shots um, at the appropriate times, which is first grade and fifth grade. Um, you know, and a lot of times, you, you know, we see kids where they would get, a, you know, the bulk of their immunizations to get them up so that they could go into the first grade um, in the public schools. So we thought there was a problem. Now, this was in 1992, and we filed a lawsuit then. And this suit kicked around the court system. We filed it in the federal court up in Chicago. And it kicked around the court system um, until it went to trial in April 2004. So that's 12 years. Um, so I always say when I talk about this lawsuit, it's a cautionary tale. Because um, there was certainly no quick justice in this case. Um, 
Let me talk a little bit about the claims that we had in the suit, and there's one that's of particular interest, I think, here. We had three claims. One, we argued that children and pregnant women did not have equal access to care. And there's a provision in the Federal Medicaid Act, and it's for um, folks who want to go look it up, 42 U.S.C. section 1396 small a, parenthetical a, parenthetical 30. And it's a very simple clause. It's short compared to most of the parts of the Medicaid Act. But what it says is, that people on Medicaid are supposed to have the same access to care, to doctors, to medical providers, as people in the general population. And the courts who have looked at that have said, well, we interpret that to mean people in the general population with private health insurance, because obviously people in the, private, in the general population who are uninsured have even worse access than Medicaid recipients do, although maybe not Champaign County, from what I'm hearing. Um, but that's the gloss that's been put on it. And in fact, in this case, that's the, the gloss that Judge Lefko put on it in this case, which is I'm comparing um, this class of kids and, um, to kids who have private health insurance in Chicago. But while the class was pending over these 12 years, the pregnant women claim got dropped because there was a pretty significant increase in obstetrical rates by the State Department of um, Public Aid in the late 90s, and we we're finding that we couldn't find people having trouble finding access for prenatal care and obstetrical care. Now I hear that that's now becoming a problem again, but at the time we didn't think that we could prove that, so we dropped that claim, so we were left with kids. We also only filed on behalf of kids in Cook County, okay? We only filed in Cook County because we thought, you know, first of all, we're filing this huge lawsuit, we're just lawyers, we're not specialists. Um, we know Cook County, we don't know the rest of the state. And we thought that things were very different in the Collar counties in Chicago, and we suspected they were very different downstate, but we didn't know. Um, so we didn't take that on. We also filed for kids because we thought um, that that was um, a better case than coming in with 58-year-olds with arthritis and diabetes and some past alcohol abuse. Um, we thought kids would be a better group to, to litigate on behalf. We thought we would get a, a fair shake from the courts. Now, is that a horrible thing to do? Perhaps, but, but you have to think about that when you litigate because it's a huge investment of time and, as it turned out, money in this case to do this. Um, so we went to trial and, and we had two different claims there. We, we argued that in Cook County, children didn't have the same access to physicians that kids in private insurance did. And we also argued that kids in Cook County didn't get preventive health care as required under another part of the Medicaid Act, the Early Periodic Screening, Diagnosis, and Treatment, or EPSDT, provisions of the Medicaid Act. Um, we went to trial in May of 2004. We got a decision from Judge Lefko in August of 2004. I want to just talk about the kind of proof that we put on as you think about this in Champaign County. Um, First of all, we actually were able, after we sued the state, to get through discovery all their encounter data for every kid in Cook County for about a five to six year period. We had um, like 10 million computer records. Um, we didn't have actual data on the kid. We did. We had their actual claim history. It was scrambled, so we couldn't identify a kid, although we knew by zip code, or at least the last known zip code. And we had a guy go through um, at the University of Maryland who we found who could analyze his data. And he did something different than anyone I've, I've seen ever did. We actually went through and we were able to track each kid. So we could look at a kid from birth to age one and see how many times they went to the doctor, how many immunizations they got, how many times they got a lead blood screen. And then based on that, we could accumulate that data. So we could say over a set time period, say a two year window, that every kid that was between birth and age one in that period um, and we checked, and they were statistically relevant samples. In fact, they were very large samples, you know, 200,000 and 300,000 kids. We could track how many immunizations, how many exams, um, and visits they had for well care. We could also, we had data, so we could track sick kid visits as well. And we were able to show that the number of kids getting well kid visits were incredibly, incredibly well in Cook County. Um, probably a third of the kids after they got out of the hospital in the first year of life never had a well child never went to the doctor except for a sick kid visit. Um, probably another half of the kids had one to two in an in a age group where you're supposed to go to the doctor six times. 
we were able to show that probably well over 50% of kids weren't getting timely immunizations. Um, I don't know how you could show that unless you had that data. Um, although, the state does maintain and are getting better at maintaining a lot of other data. And you may actually be able to pull Cornerstone data. It's a program run by the Department of Public Health and actually use that to look at well child visits. And, and they actually look at the data similar to the way that we look at it. And immunizations. And they're actually tracking um, what is it, the 431 sequence for kids up to 24 months. So you can actually get a pretty good picture of how your kids are doing in Champaign County if you can pull that data. And we did use that data as well. We also were able to get data from the managed care organizations that operate in Clark County. Do you guys have managed care for your Medicaid down here? Good, good, We're very lucky. Uh, that is not that is not capitated care. That is something very different. Uh, it's not a capitated program, at least as I understand it sitting here today. So it's a good thing. But you should push your folks to make sure that that's, that is active. It's not going to that, because I don't think you want to go into a capitated program um, for this population um, without a lot of safeguards that this state's been unwilling to be able to put into effect and, and make sure they get you know, the, the safeguards are uh, applied. We also, um, for showing the equal access, it was harder, it's much harder to document equal access, at least in an environment as large as Cook County, because it's hard to measure where kids go. We actually put on, we had testimony at trial from a number of um, doctors at um, teaching hospitals. We had cooperation with, from the University of Chicago. We had cooperation from Children's Memorial Hospital. We had some cooperation from Loyola. And we also got cooperation from the Illinois chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics. So we were able to put on seven different doctors at various institutions. We had ER doctors. We had the head of the ER at Children's. We had the previous head of the ER at the University of Chicago. Um, we had a pediatric surgeon um, from Loyola. We had a doctor in private practice from the city. Um, we had a dentist from Children's. We had the heads of the pediatric departments from Children's and from the University of Chicago who testified about equal access. And we also had tried to pull, and we actually hired an expert, a gentleman named Sam Flint, who went through and looked at the, um, um, the um, research that had been done on why doctors don't take Medicaid cases. And we put all that in. Um, and Judge Lefkoe was convinced after the trial. She said, um, and I'm just reading from a press release that I handed out, that, that the meaning of equal access to medical care contained in medical law so that children are entitled to equal access equal to that of children with private insurance. And then she concluded that the children have met their burden of establishing the defendants have violated their rights by failing to provide them with equal, equal access to medical services. And she found that the um, state had not complied with this equal access provision. Now, this equal access provision is not limited to kids. It's all recipients of Medicaid, okay? <coughs> And I think it's applicable here. But the person or the group you go after is a little different than probably who you've thought about. You basically go against the state and you say, state, you haven't done enough to make this program um, attractive enough to get private, private doctors in your community to get in and serve these people. I think if you can show, though, that the, is that um, kids on Medicaid don't have the same access, that that really makes your claim under this, under this part of the Medicaid Act. And then the relief that you would get, and I'll talk about the relief that we're getting in Nomsovsky, is that the state would have to implement some sort of plan to increase access for kids on Medicaid. So that it's not, so that it's, it, this, it's basically the same type of access that kids on private insurance have. Or, persons on private insurance yet. So that is the claim, and that's what's really applicable for Minnesota. Now, after we got our decision in August 2004, that didn't mean that we had relief. Judge Lefko only ruled on liability, and then she really wanted us to try to figure out how to settle this with the state. She said, I don't think federal judges do a good job legislating from the bench to correct social problems. She's probably right. And so we entered into a pretty exhaustive, about eight-month negotiation with 
what's now healthcare and family services, and periphery, and governor's office. And we, we worked out a settlement that was finally entered by Judge Lefko in November. And it does a couple of different things. First of all, there are some rate increases in there. And in the back of the thing that I handed out, I just have the list of codes that were increasing. And it's Exhibit C on here, and that's because it was Exhibit C to the final settlement order. And we actually increased 12 codes, which is a small number of codes when you think about, there's probably 10,000 different codes that doctors could go. Um, we knew statistically that in a clinic or outpatient office setting, that this was about, I would say, about 40% of all billed services. And we knew that there was another code, a 99212, which picked up about another 10 to 15% of billed services. And doctors that we talked to said that they suspected that because um, the way it works, the 99.213 is the same as this 99.212, it just involves more time, the doctors would probably be billing a lot more 99.213s than they ever had, and you won't see as many 99.212s. The rates themselves were modeled, and they were about 80 to 85% of Medicare rates in the city of Chicago. And Medicare rates in the state of Illinois, as they are around the nation, they, they actually identify different geographic areas for rates. I think there are four different Medicare ge um, geographic areas in the state of Illinois. There's one around East St. Louis. There's what I in Chicago call downstate. Um, there's suburban Cook County, and then there's the city of Chicago. The city of Chicago is the highest of the four. My understanding is that these rates, say for example, they'll now pay $72.97 for a doctor who sees a kid on a 99.214, is that that's probably at or a little higher than what Medicare would pay in Champaign County to a doctor um, who saw a kid under a 99.214. Most of these rates involve preventive health care because our suit was that there isn't enough preventive health care there. And we had a reason for doing that. We thought that if we could prove that kids weren't getting preventive health care, and we could get a system that started to make sure that kids did get preventive health care, that then we could move on to the next problem, which is what do you do with the kids who need follow-up care after they get the preventive health care? What we call the T part of the early, early and periodic screening diagnosis and treatment provisions of the Medicaid Act. So these rates, although it was a Cook County suit, apply statewide. And we kind of whipsaw the state a little. I probably shouldn't say that. We're on tape. Um, we told we didn't care what they did with rates in the rest of the state because um, we were we had a Cook County class. And quite frankly, that's all we could do legally because we had to represent the um, represent our class. But we suspected that whatever they did in, in Cook County, they were going to have to do down. Excuse me for using it downstate as well. Okay, that they were going to have to do it in the whole state. And in fact, that turned out to be the case because we knew that HFS does not want to run a two-tier or a multi-tier reimbursement program for Medicaid. We also got increases in dental services, and that's the next page. And our understanding for kids is that this was about 60 to 70 percent of all billed services for kids with dentists, and the rates were modeled on what was being paid for employees of the state of Illinois under the 2005 <coughs> state of Illinois employees dental plan. And we thought that was a pretty good benchmark, okay? These go into effect on January 1st as well. They go into effect statewide. Now, the other thing that the Memosofsky decision did is that they agreed to hire an entity in Cook County that would be operative as of January 1st, 07, to actually recruit doctors and get doctors to participate in Medicaid. We hope and we don't know if this will be the case, that it turns out, and the PCCM stuff kind of throws a wrench into this, that they end up contracting with someone like the Illinois chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics or the Illinois Association of Family Physicians or some sort of consortium so that doctor groups are actually involved in helping recruit doctors to see kids on Medicaid. And one of the things that I would love to see in Cook County and the rest of the state as well is that for doctors who take no Medicaid, that they would agree to say, okay, I'm gonna take some Medicaid. I took none before, maybe I take 10 cases. Maybe I take five cases. Dip their toe in the water, see what they can do, and start to take some of those cases. Because my sense of it in, in Cook County, and I think this is clear in Champaign County, is that we have a two-tiered system that 
Um, private doctors who see people with private health insurance don't do Medicaid. And I think the sense is that we want to get the private physician community back in to seeing people on Medicaid um, as part of it. And I have to say, as I go off on a tangent now, increasingly, Medicaid is the largest health care provider in the state of Illinois. When you, compare, when you combine that with kid care, with all kids, with what I think will be some future expansions in state-run Medicaid programs as the state, I hope, moves to try to cover the uninsured, they're going to be a huge population, and that, that program's there, and it's not going away. Um, and we need to have doctors involved in it. We need to have the breadth of the medical community taking people on Medicaid, and then we, that means that we need to figure out and the state needs to figure out how we can make that program work for doctors so that they get back into Medicaid. We're not asking people to be the Medicaid doctor. I know when we talk to doctors in Cook County, their hesitancy was, as soon as I'm identified as the doctor who takes Medicaid, everyone dumps on me. There's probably some truth to that. Um, um, just from my experience in doing legal representation, I do certain types of cases that no one else likes to do, and I get dumped on. I know that, that it probably happens with doctors. They say, oh, you can tell Dr. Jones, that dumb schmuck will take Medicaid, and you can probably get in. Um, you, you want to have lots of doctors taking some cases, okay? And that's really one of our goals. And so we're hoping that by getting the doctors' groups involved to recruit doctors, that we can work on that. The medical rates and the dental rates go into effect on January 1st. There's a, a slight increase for federally qualified health <coughs> clinics. What's the name of the FQHD group? Francis. 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 So they may get an increase, I'm not sure. The way the numbers worked out, some um, FQHDs in the states got increases, some didn't. <coughs> Everyone was going to be held harmless. But some people um, were going to get some increases. The other thing that's going to happen, this says, and this starts in the second quarter of 2007, is that the state is going to pay a $30 bonus to doctors who provide all the well-child exams that a kid's supposed to get in a year. So it's an interesting provision because in the first year of life you get six, your second year of life you get three, three, four, five, six, you get one, I think, and thereafter you get one every other year, although probably the state is going to have to move to authorizing paying for a well kid exam every year of life up to age 18. Um, what this says is that if you provide all the exams you're supposed to to a kid in a certain year of life, you get a $30 bonus. So zero to one, you've got to do six once they get out of the hospital. That's hard to do. <coughs> one to two, it's three. I think that's more likely. Three and up, excuse me. You do one exam, you've done everything they're supposed to get. So you're going to take a fee here. We'll just take, say, a 99, um, 392 which I think is the uh, code that covers kids from about two to five, and you'll now get $77.87. If you provide that one well-child exam, you get a $30 bonus. So you're basically getting paid $107.87 to provide a well-child exam. So we think and we're hoping that this can also entice some doctors to get back into the game, and that's something that's statewide as well. Now, the other thing that we're going to get is we're going to get pretty detailed reporting starting next summer, but it's only going to be in Cook County because this is a Cook County case. The state agreed to look at kids in the way we do, so they're going to actually track kids as they get older. So we can say, gee, we know how many kids from birth to age one got two exams, three exams, four exams, because we think that's a better measure of how they're doing then picking a snapshot date and saying, okay, however you all, old you are on that day, we're going to look at how many exams you got in the previous year. Um, it's just not an accurate thing to do, particularly as kids change from, you know, 10 months old to their first birthday because they go from six exams to three exams. So it's misleading statistics. Now, the other thing that the state agreed to do is they agreed to look at specialist services. And they're supposed to get out specs for a study on access to specialist services by May 15th. 2006, and we're going to be working very hard because our sense was the big thing that we didn't deal with in the settlement to Memosovsky was access to specialty care. We had some proof on it in the case. The judge made some findings on problems with access to specialist care. In fact, we had a pediatric surgeon testify from Loyola that said, you know, I have such trouble getting paid by the state and they won't pay when I do two, um, say, procedures in one surgery that I would actually cut an a kid open on Medicaid twice to fix two hernias um, because I can't get paid for both hernias if I do it in one time. Um, you know, and I mean, this was the kind of testimony that we got at trial. 
Um, so they're going to look at special services. And our sense is, is that special services are still a huge problem in the state of Illinois. It's a huge problem in Cook County. Um, we think that certain specialty areas are very much a problem. Mental health is a huge problem for us. There just is an extreme shortage of um, mental health services for kids on Medicaid in Cook County. I bet it's the same way down here. Um, although it sounds like you have everything. Um, else as well. Um, the other thing is that the court retained jurisdiction over this case. So we will continue, and it's interesting, the, the group that tried this case, it was myself and Stephanie Altman from Health and Disability Advocates. There was an attorney named John Bowman from the Shriver Center up in Chicago who's done this. And then we had a private firm who, who came in whole hog. I mean, they had about $3 million into the case by the time we went to the trial. And they are going to stay are committed to staying in this case as well. So we've got seven attorneys, five attorneys, um, who are going to stay on this case, I think, probably for many, many years. Because our goal is to try to achieve equal access for kids on Medicaid. And we're hoping, and then that drags along um, kid care and all kids as well, in Cook County. Um, and we're hoping that as we get things, that it filters down down the state. That doesn't mean, though, that you couldn't do something like this in Champaign County. Okay? And when I look at these issues, it seems to me that there's a couple different things that come to mind. And I'm just going to go through them in, in kind of a, a, in a no particular order. One is some sort of pursuing an equal access strategy with the state of Illinois. Now, you probably have to find lawyers who can do that, um, who aren't in legal services programs that are restricted. I will say that litigating is an incredibly expensive proposition. Um, we couldn't have done it in health and disability advocates by ourselves. You know, we probably did um, 30 or 40 depositions in this case. Every time you do a deposition, you know, it's costing you $1,500 to $2,000 to order transcripts and, and things like this. So it becomes very costly very quickly to do this. Um, but that is one solution and, and one that you probably want to think about. The second one, and I was just asking Claudia, is that there at least was and still are provisions under federal law and the Hill Burton provisions of the Social Security Act that required public hospitals that took money saying that they had a, commu a continuing community service obligation. Now, I realize that you have this kind of um, Chinese wall that's been built between your medical practice, your hospital, your medical center, and the physician practices, but my memory of this is, is that people have to be able to go to hospitals if they're on Medicaid in their catchment area or their service area and be seen, and that the hospital has to take steps to ensure that there are, medic that there are doctors there who are willing to take Medicaid as a payment source. So I would suggest that, that you might want to look at that. I'm aware that you've talked with the State Office of Attorney General. Uh, my understanding is they're still looking at Champaign County. Um, although I don't have much more in the way details about what I know that they're doing right now. But when I talked to them earlier this week, they were well aware of the situation. Um, and I don't know. The other thing that I would throw out as a possible model is that, is that we work a lot with DuPage County, which is straight west of Cook County, and in some ways a very different county than Champaign County because it's incredibly wealthy. Um, I try not to go there because it's too many um, Humvees and SUVs, it's impossible <laughs> to drive there. Um, but it's a very wealthy county. But they too have a, a fast growing uninsured and Medicaid eligible population, particularly as a lot of industry, service industry moves to the power counties in Chicago. And they've been very aggressive as a county, pulling together the different players, just like you have here, and trying to come up with solutions to provide access to care to people in DuPage County. And among the things that they've done is that they have worked to expand their FQHCs. In fact, until two years ago, they had no FQHCs in DuPage County. They now have one or two. I think their plan is in the next year to have four or five. And they've reached out to county government. Um, it helps that um, the Speaker of the House of Representatives has a little piece of DuPage County to the federal government. But you've got members of Congress here. Um, Re reached out and, and and come up with seed money to start FQH to start and, and to expand the FQHC base in DuPage County. The other thing that they did, and they worked with all the hospitals, with the big physician groups, and they really did, because I was at a few of their meetings, really try to put the arm to them to say, we want you to get back into Medicaid 
We're not asking you to be inundated, but we do want you to take some people and we want you to agree to see people on Medicaid and also there to take people who are uninsured and agree to take referrals and to take clients. And the, the promise that they made to them was, we're not going to inundate you with people. We're going to give you some. We're not going to give you many. So that you can have, and there's an organized way for doctors to take people on Medicaid so that they don't think they're going to get inundated. Okay? Um, they have also, they've also done that with access to mental health care. But, and the fourth thing that I would throw out there is that you might want to look at a joint solution where maybe you have to do some things like threaten equal access litigation or bring it to get the state, and maybe they're willing to come on already, I don't know, um, to get them to be a player in this and to get your county and local governmental units to be a player and to reach out to the provider community because I think if you don't all do it together, you're not going to get a solution that works in Champaign County. Um, and interestingly, in Cook County, we don't have all those people together yet, and, and that's one of the things that we worry about as we move ahead in Memesowski, is trying to bring all the different players together so that we can work on this. And we're working at putting together things like this. I'm amazed to see this many people out at 1 o'clock on a Thursday afternoon. This is just unbelievable. And I give you it. Um, but I think you have to think about things like that. Um, let me say one other thing about Memesovsky, because when we talked to doctors um, about why they didn't participate in Medicaid, one of the things they said were low rates. The other thing they said was, it takes forever to get paid. And, and it does. And it's a real problem. The one thing that we were able to get in Memesovsky, and I have to tell you that when you talk to the state about payment cycle, that is the one area that they just absolutely won't go there. They won't go there. Because that's how they balance their books. Right. The state of Illinois is that as the bills come in and the money comes in, if there isn't enough money, they just sit on those bills. And that's how they run their budget. And then every year when they do a new budget, they, kinda, they, they always take care of those old bills. And if you're a, a medical provider here, you know often what happens is you'll start and they're like, They'll say 50, which means you're really at 75 or 80 days payment cycle at the start of a state fiscal year. And that just keeps getting longer all through the year. And then when they do their next budget bill, they'll usually find some money. They'll steal it from the pension fund that they didn't fund um, or something like that. And they'll buy down those medical bills. And then they just start the whole process over again. Well, what they did say in this case is at least for kids, that they, was, they said that if providers were enrolled MCH providers, maternal and child health providers, that they would give those people priority. Um, they, they were then become eligible for priority status when they get in line to get paid, to get their bills paid. And we have talked to doctors, and, and this works probably better for office practitioners than it does for specialists. Because if you see a kid on a 99-213, which is a office visit for, boy, I can't remember, it's like, up to 30 minutes or something like that. It's not a, bit, a real controversial billing. I mean, if you put it in, they're not going to pull it unless you build 10 of them for that kid in the day um, or something like that. So that one's going to go through, get just going to clear through the system pretty quickly. And then if you have, you're eligible for being at the head of the queue for payment, doctors that we've, been, we've talked to who said they, they, they have expedited payment as MCH providers are getting paid in 30 days, even when the payment cycle is much longer when you look at the statewide averages. So that's the other thing that I think you might want to think about as you get in there is talking with the state, getting them to cooperate, and sitting down with the doctors who are seeing people and trying to get them to expedite payments, at least for things that are more routine. Now the problem is that there's specialty codes, and this really hits the hospitals hard, is, is that those, those payments often, will, those um, submissions for payment will get pulled and looked at, and that can slow down the payment process dramatically, but we do have that. It wasn't as good as I would have liked to have, but it was a settlement, and the problem with settlements is you're always given a little to get something, and I will say, I mean, the thing about litigation, this case was like 12 and 13 years old, and if we didn't settle, we knew that it would have gone up to the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, and we thought we had a pretty good decision and a good record, but you never know what could happen there. Plus, it could take the Seventh Circuit a year and a half to make a ruling on it. You know, we would go up and brief it, 
in three or four months, and then we would wait for seven or eight months for have to get an argument date. And then we would wait many months to get a written decision. And a lot of times the decision would be we affirm, we send it back down to the district court to figure out what the remedy is. So we would have been right back where we started. So that's one of the things that we thought about when we went ahead and settled this. So I guess my lesson to you is if you can figure out a way to get these different parties to sit down, and I think you've got to get the state in here, and I think it means, I wish you weren't taking me, but you are. That, um, I know that. Um, you've, got to get, you've got to get Anne Marie over here, and you've got to get them to sit down, and you've got to get the providers to sit down, and you've got to say, you know, we need to think outside the box before we do something rash here. Um, you know, don't make me do something stupid. Um, and get them to focus on this and think about ways that they can deal with this access issue in Champaign County. And I would suggest you might pull in the AG's office as well, I don't know, that's a tougher one. Um, but think about those state players, your county players, federal players as well, um, and the community um, to try to think about what you might ask the state to do, how they could do things, how they could deal with this. And what they get out of it is they get to fix something. I think he's running for re-election. I think people vote in Champaign County. Um, it might be a good thing to look at. I mean, in terms of going to someone and saying, we need to deal, this is as good a time as you're going to get um, with, with um, impending elections um, next November. Okay. No one's asking me any questions. I just keep <laughs> for Adam, Jump in. Okay. So we do, our state, get the benefit of these enhanced reimbursement rates. Right? Yes. The as of January 1, 2006. Okay. But you're saying know. this this sort of priority of the timing of the payments. I think that's that downstate too, yes. They're going to do that statewide. Okay. So what more could you get if you were already getting this? Dr. Stewart-Sefton? You've got to get doctors in the game. And remember, these are only kids. These are kids' codes, and they're preventive health care codes by and large, and the two most commonly used sick kid visits in an outpatient setting. But wasn't a significant part of your claim the EPSET claim, which wouldn't That's be right. available for adults? That's right. I mean, it's a stronger legal argument for kids. The equal access is the same for kids and adults. The law, the provision in the law does not discriminate. It doesn't say this is for kids only or for adults. The EPSDT we put in because it's a hook that we could use with the kids that we were litigating on. And we knew, we knew that if we could get state data, that we could provide pretty hard data on exactly what was happening. It's harder to do in a place like Cook County when you sit down and try and get your finger on equal access, okay? And I'm telling you, we thought, I mean, we spent months spinning our wheels thinking about how we could do a survey that we could get admitted into court. And if you go into the literature, there's some surveys you'll see, like there's a, something called the SCAG study in California. Gee, I had a staff on my desk where they actually do things like they'll call a doctor's office and they'll say, gee, I'd like to get an appointment for my child, um, blah, blah, blah. He has Medicaid. Mm -hmm. I'd like to get an appointment for my child. He has private health insurance. The hard part we found out by doing that is that some private health insurance is doctors take, some they don't. My guess is when you have two big practices, like you do in Champaign, they probably take almost all private health insurances. Uh, my guess is that. Maybe there are some that they don't take. Um, not always preferred providers. Not always is preferred, but mm -hmm. but they will see you because they know that they're going to get paid something. They're going to get paid 60% of a reasonable customary charge as opposed to 80 or whatever it is. Um, but we decided that we weren't going to, we just couldn't do it. I mean, we actually had an entity that does survey data that we had lined up to do it. And we just finally said, oh, we're not going to get this in. We just don't think, looking at case law, that we can get it admitted to court. Um, so we looked at a lot of different ways to try to prove it. And to a certain extent, what we relied on was anecdotal. And you guys have far better than that, I suspect, if everything you're saying, you can, you can show that. And, and the second part is that we really looked at the literature, and we had someone look at all the studies that had been done. Um, actually, a guy named Sam Flynn, who was a health economist. He'd been at the American Academy of Pediatrics for a long time, and now he teaches over in the um, Indiana University system. 
And he looked at the literature, and the literature really shows that rate of reimbursement is identified when you talk to doctors as one of the major reasons that they don't claim Medicaid. Um, because, the, you know, the reimbursement rates are so low compared to private health insurance. Yeah. Having experienced the uh, emergency department overload here locally, and also working with uh, Champaign County Christian Health Center, it seems to me that one of the things that we need is uh, linkage of data for adults, um, proving and providing a case of cost effectiveness that uh, controlling the blood pressure of the diabetes will actually yield tangible results in unreimbursed, unreimbursed emergency care and hospitalizations. And one of the things we did um, is to look at the iPlan data and uh, take note of the particular parameters of Champaign County, uh, noting that, for instance, the death rates for prostate cancer for African Americans here in the county are higher than anywhere else in the state. Uh, looking at some other things like hospitalizations for diabetic uh, complications are higher. One of the projects that uh, we have started this past year uh, with the uh, Department of Community Health is to actually pick our top three diagnosis at the free clinic, that being high blood pressure, diabetes, and depression, and to actually look at uh, a cost um, a cost effectiveness model of controlling their chronic disease versus the outcomes of hospitalization, ER visits. And I was just wondering if you did any of that sort of data analysis in presenting your case. We didn't because we were dealing with kids. Although, if we were dealing with adults, I think we would have looked at that. Which actually, you raise an excellent point. And one of the reasons, <coughs> if you reach out to the state, if you reach out to healthcare and family services, for them to get involved, is that they're paying more than they need to pay in Champaign County for Medicaid. And to get them involved, and they might be able to actually save money by coming in. And they might not care about the death rate, but they do care about the number of ER visits because they're paying for that. The other reason that it's an interesting time to bring that up is because, and let's talk about all kids for a second. This, you know, recently the state passed a bill, it was the Big Bogoyevich Initiative, to cover kids up to um, actually kids of any income level under a Medicaid plan. And the state said to pay for it that they were going to implement some sort of case management. Okay. Let me just talk about this. When we talked to folks at the state and said, how much is all kids going to cost you in the first year or two, they said, 25 million. 25 million. That's chump change in the HFS budget. They can find 25 million in there to do this. We said, yeah, and we, we knew that was the answer because we knew what the uptake rate would be. They said there's 250,000 kids who could be insured. Probably that first year they may get 50,000, and if they do, they're doing great. Kids are really cheap to insure, okay? And so it probably cost 25 million for that first year. They also announced at the same time, and we've gone back and forth in our office why they announced this, that they wanted to go into some sort of PCCM model, uh, a case management model um, for Illinois. And Anne Marie Murphy, who's the Medicaid director, has been very clear, as has Luanna Peters, who is the County Human Services liaison in the Office of Governor, when you talk to them, that this is not a capitated program but that they would like to get into some sort of medical home program where that medical home was providing case management. And the first part of that is they have to make sure that a kid, because this is all kids, but it's going to expand, I think, and they wanted to actually do the PCCM model for all recipients of Medicaid, but they'll roll it out. Let's talk about kids first. First part of it is they've got to find a home for that kid. Then they probably have to pay that home some money to do case management. And they're talking about something like a three to five month monthly management fee or something like that. And they're hoping that if they do that, and then they're going to treat it in, they'll pay fee for service, as I understand it, except they will still have this existing um, MCO or managed care organization model in the parts of the state that they still have it. And then they may 
increase it, but my sense is that it would remain voluntary. And you have to know that there's a huge push to um, basically auto, you know, to have involuntary. Everyone has to enroll in a mass care organization. Um, there were hearings on it last day. In fact, there was a hearing in Carl last summer in Champaign on that. Um, I think to date it's fair to say that the managed care organizations in Illinois have a crappy track record and they haven't been able to show that they could do it. Uh, and to go off on a tangent for a second, it's funny, when we looked at preventive health care rates for MCOs in Cook County, it was worse. It was worse than fee-for-service, um, which didn't shock us at all, but it shocked everyone else. This, you know, they've constructed this program. So it's not going to be capitated when they go into this PCCM model. But they're going to try to do case management. And the first part of this is they've got to find a medical home for these folks. So if you can't find a medical home, you can't do case management. They then are talking about expanding that from kids into the rest of the population. Adults, parents, persons who are on because they're disabled, persons who are elderly, although they're going to exclude dually eligible Medicare and Medicaid folks because it's too complicated to figure out how to do it with the Medicare and Medicaid payments, particularly with Part D kicking in. <laughs> and, and, I don't take any Part D questions. Um, and folks in nursing homes, okay? Now, it seems to me that it's a good time if Champaign County wants to talk about it, to talk to the state about how they might want to do some pilot projects here looking at case management for different populations. I think it's fair to say that the state doesn't have a good idea yet how they're going to run this PCCM model. Mm -hmm. And you should reach out to Anne Marie Murphy, you should reach out to Steve Saunders, who is now over at Healthcare and Family Services, who's in charge of figuring out how to do this PCCM model. And to reach out to those folks, because I've always thought that if you're going to jump into this, I mean, if they jump into whole hog, they'll screw it up. There's just no way they won't. If we did it, we'd screw up. You just, they need to go in slowly. They need to do some pilots. Seems like Champaign County is as good a place to come in and do that as any. Mm -hmm. um, well, we're the fifth largest county in the state. We don't have huge amounts of population, but as far as case management, at least public health nurse case management, we're already doing that. That's right. But you got to find the medical homes. So they got to figure that's out a way problem. to get those medical homes so they can provide that kind of care. So, I'm thinking that it's a good time to try to sit down and talk to, your, to our elected state players, and they're not elected, but they serve it for us, mm -hmm. uh, and try to get them to think about this. I had a question, because I see in our county, and I'm assuming throughout the state, dental services are just incredibly lacking. Dental's a huge problem. Is We're dental hoping part of what... Yeah, we actually have dental rates, and there is on here, and I'll just hand them to you. There's an increase in dental codes for kids. We're under oh, here. Oh, our okay. Back into that. I don't think that's going to happen anytime in the next year or two. Um, but I think dental is going to continue to be a huge problem. Well, just a simple example. I'm sure everyone's well aware that we presented one of my clinics with an abscess and with a high temperature, you know, I might feasibly end up send them to the ED where they get fluids and they get, how much does one bag of IV antibiotics cost today? I have no idea. And so they're taking up space and money when if they were seen preventatively, we could probably prevent it, the abscess or the septic situation. And I will say, I see people who self-treat as well. So oh, not I do. Um, you know, yeah, so you'll see a lot of people who took the tooth out. Yeah. Um, yeah. And brother did. Um, just real quick, um, I know other people want to ask questions, yeah, so ask um, let's see, we have Andrea and Julie, or Diana and uh, Julie. I'm sorry, Diana, um, Julie, Jeff. I just want to know, does it not make sense for counties to work together on this, or does it become too unmanageable, or I mean, should each county sue the state individually? Over this, you know, sitting here today, it's really hard to sue them. Yeah. It, it's, it's difficult. When you sue them, the first thing you do is you go through about a year of briefing where they try to throw you out of court. 
Um, and they're getting better that, lawyers than they used to be. I'm have. just thinking of the yeah. threat of a, you know, you have some leverage with a threat of a lawsuit and you have some resources if you collaborate with others. I mean, why, why does each county... Well, the, the, the problem is the circumstances are very different in different locales, and that's what makes it sort of unwieldy like as a class action. Well, we do have some unique factors in this county because of the because of the concentration of the medical practice and the fact that both of the major uh, primary care providers are really restricting their Medicaid intake. It's unique within the land of Lincoln service area, which is the 765 counties. Well, can I say this? I mean, I always say deal with what you know. Um, and you know Champaign County, and you may know a neighboring county. I don't know. Um, but, and I wouldn't go in threatening litigation, quite frankly. Oh, yeah. And I very rarely threaten litigation. Um, in fact, my sense is you don't threaten unless you're willing to do it. In fact, I have never threatened a lawsuit unless I had a complaint ready to roll. Um, so, but that's not your strongest card. And so don't go in and say, we're going to sue you guys. You're going to be so sad. You're going to say, you know, we got a problem, which means you got a problem, but we working together can come up with a solution. But what I'm saying is, if you, I don't think if you can't get the state and maybe the feds or something like that involved yeah. and bring you all together, you're not going to come up with a solution that works. I mean, the funny thing about Memesoski is, is that we're really at the same point as you guys are. It's just that now, when I call the state, they return my phone call. <laughs> um, because, but, but they're pretty good right now about returning phone calls anyway. Um, I mean, I find HFS right now to be a little more responsive than it maybe was in the past. Um, and so I would do that. And, and the card that you have to play is that you know where you're at really well, and you think that you can save the state some money, and it fits in with their PCCM model of where they want to go, and you guys are as good a laboratory to figure out how to do it for adults and persons with disabilities as anywhere else in the state. Because you're kind of here, and you're not like Cook County. I mean, I know it's a transient community at all, but, but you can actually get all the players and set them around the table in a way that you can't do in Cook County or in DuPage County. I mean, that's an amazing effort where they pull that together. But, you know, when I would go to those meetings, I'd be in a room three times this stuff, you know. Um, you could pull the players together, and I think then you have to look for them to try to do something, and the argument is you can save money here, and you can create a better system, and it can be a model for how you do it in other counties around the state. Um, and maybe then it's a model for how you do it for the counties that are joined, because at some point, if they're going to roll this out, they got to figure out how to do it, and it's very different doing a case a, a, a case management program in Champaign than it is, say, way south in some of the counties, or DuPage County, or something like that, um, you know, or the city of Chicago. It's just, it's going to be different. I mean, the problems are the same, but the logistical solutions are going to be a little different. And so I guess what I'm suggesting is um, that you might want to do that. Now, one thing that we do at Health and Disability Advocates, and I'm sorry I'm talking so much, but we run this group called the Medicaid Leadership Group that we put together a couple years ago because every year we go down and try to move stuff in the legislature. Like a couple years ago, we had a bill to move the um, Medicaid income limits for um, aged, blind, and disabled 100% of poverty because it used to be set at 133% of the TANF rate. It's really, really low, about 40% of poverty. And it took us like three years to pass that. And we would go down, and we were getting our butts kicked by all these different entities, you know? And it was like, and we'd go into meetings with um, um, guys who worked in the old Edgar um, and Ryan administrations, and they'd go, oh, if I give you this, then we're going to have to screw so-and-so, and, you know? And we'd say, oh, man, it's us versus the Illinois Hospital Association. We lose. Mm -hmm. Or it's us versus the State Medical Society. We lose. Mm -hmm. So... What we said is we're going to pull everyone together. So we actually, in Chicago, run a group, and it's statewide to some extent, where we can sit down with the Illinois Hospital Association, not so much the State Medical Society, because they've really dropped out of Medicaid, as far as I'm concerned, it's turned into a specialist group, but with the pediatricians, with the family docs, we have the pharmaceuticals there, which is a weird thing. 
that we don't kill them when they come in the room. We have the pharmacists, uh, we have consumer and, groups. And the ISAF, emergency physicians group. We don't have them. are very concerned about them. Yeah, we need to bring them in. And talk about solutions. Um, the FQHCs, I forgot that. Um, and, and, and sit down and say, we've got a problem. What are your concerns? What are your concerns? How can we come up with something? And, and I'm not saying it's easy to do, but to me, that's the only way that you're going to get to a solution. I mean, you can sue them, you get a finding a liability, and then you say, okay, now let's solve the problem. And it might be that you're at the we can solve the problem stage without having to sue them, which means you say 12 years and about, you don't know, $3 million. So, um, so I think that's the way that you might want to try to do it. Um, just going to Jeff. Okay, Jeff. Well, my question is a little more broad. You mentioned this the idea of the billing taking so long, and we know there's federal pressure to even decrease Medicaid dollars even more. What's your sense from the state in terms of, you know, future, you know, being able to pay for Medicaid at all in the future? Well, you know, what's going on in D.C. now is, is I mean, well, you guys know, you have um, Representative Johnson who's been in the middle of it. Um, but Congress has been trying to cut Medicaid. You know, when you look at the whole scheme of things, they're not huge cuts, but they're hugely symbolic cuts. And the things that they would like to do, the co-pays, which at least the data I've seen show just don't work at all, um, probably are incredibly counterproductive. But, you know, my sense of Medicaid is this, is that now it's here and they can't take it back. They don't get to go back to 1964 when we didn't have Medicaid. And they don't get to go back to 1978 before a lot of the expansion started to happen. They don't get to go back to 1990 before they dumped a lot of kids in when they um, passed the state children's health insurance program. So I don't know how they can get rid of it, quite frankly. Um, and the other thing that we found that is they start to cut Medicaid, you have all these other allies. Suddenly the whole healthcare industry says, boy, if they, if they don't pay people on Medicaid, I might go out of business. I'm a hospital. I mean, I don't like serving people on Medicaid, but I do. My reimbursement rates suck. Um, but if they're coming anyway and I have to treat them and they're all uninsured, um, I go out of business. And that means that the whole community loses a hospital. And that means people who have private health insurance lose a hospital. And you'll see in the states as well a real move in the opposite direction, which is we have to figure out a way to cover the uninsured. In fact, that's happening in Illinois right now. There's this adequate health care commission that's looking at, and they brought all the different players to the table, are there ways that we can cover the uninsured? Um, I just think that it's a train that they can't stop. And I think that we all have to fight like crazy to protect it, um, and we have to fight like crazy to improve it, and I look forward to the day that we can replace it with a model that works better than Medicaid. But I don't see that anytime soon. So I think it's going to be there, and we, and the more we rely on it, the harder it is to get rid of. Um, you know, we're addicted to Medicaid, and we're not going to give it up. We, you know, we, that's, that's kind of my sense of what's going to happen. Paulette, um, Cindy, and then Linda? No, I was just... As I understand, well, we're going to get $4 billion to pay for all of this stuff. Some that you said about $4 billion. That just seems like a lot of, months. yeah, that seems like a lot of money to us as a community that really don't have, you know, should we fundraise to make the money to pay the attorney to see the state? Or no, I'm saying just the money? opposite. I think you have cards that you can play, that you ought to play for why they want to come in and work with Champaign County without litigating. So I'm the lawyer that's sitting here saying, don't sue somebody. <laughs> don't, you know, I'll be thrown out of the bar, so no. <laughs> but I, I think you'll be, the key to solving it is having everyone at the table. The problem with litigation is not everyone's at the table, okay? I mean, I went through six years where people at public aid wouldn't talk to me. Um, and, or I'd have people talk to me and they'd say, you know, I'm not supposed to talk to you, so don't tell anyone I talk to you. Um, because they get really mad when they talk to you. 
you know, when people at Public Aid talk to you because you're a bad person. I said, I agree I'm a bad person, but you should talk to me anyway. <laughs> um, but when you sue people, they say, you got to talk to my lawyer, okay? Right. And um, when the lawyers get in the room, and, and that's the other thing about it, is that when you settle things with lawyers, the lawyers sit in the room, a lot of times, they don't come up with the best solution, is when you have everyone sitting around the table. Um, and I think you might be able to pull that off here. I don't know. Um, I believe you're right. Um, Cindy and then Linda. Um, I'd just like to reintroduce myself. As, in addition to being a medical student, I'm also a graduate student in the Department of Community Health, working on health policy as my dissertation. And we've talked about potential um, studies that we need, data that we need collected to support us. I'm willing to do that. <laughs> okay. Because that'd be my dissertation. Um, all right now I'm putting together a proposal on access to health care with a kids care program and it can be easily converted to do this instead. Um, in addition, it seems to me we need a plan, we need a priority list. And the top two for me would be, as I see this community, we need our doctors back on board. In order to get them back on board, we need to improve their payments. So that's why we need to state. We need to so, and maybe we can use the all kids, the PCCM model as leverage to say, hey, our providers want to be a home for your Medicaid PCCM patients, but we need our providers to get better payments. That's right. And you might say, and maybe we need a bigger FQHC in Champaign County. Yeah, and my number two is. And maybe you need more than one. And we have to have linkages. And you need to have linkages. And, and what you want to, be able to say to your physician community is, we don't expect you to solve this problem. We want you to be a part of the solution to the problem. Um, and we've got nothing for uninsured. The PCCM model and the Medicaid improvement is only going to help the uninsured in that it will free up our F3C. Mm -hmm. There you That's go. Right. So mm -hmm. that would be our one, too. And we've got to go from there. Okay. Um, Linda, and then I'd like to make a few comments. Yeah. I, I guess my question goes back to what Valerie said. If we already have the down state capacity now with the, the more improved um, program here with what the governor is doing. And um, where do, and, and I guess maybe this is a Claudia question too, is our priority kids, adults, what is it that you're, you're aiming for in terms of who's under and insured, and based on this, do are we asking, or do we need to make it so much priority children since it looks like there is already that effort out there? And I say all that because, you know, I only get a little pocket of it as a township supervisor, <coughs> but I can tell you that the individuals, so many of them who are coming to the office have, well actually none of them have health and um, some of the challenges that are that I am faced with in particular is this whole issue that I'm running a program that's state mandated and if individuals are eligible for GA, they are <coughs> eligible then for medical as well, but of course there were tax caps which were put on by the state. So the state is mandating us to do something and then they capped us so that we can't do it. Um, and so I don't know how this all plays in. There are 30 township supervisors in the county, and um, how you get even more of us at the table. Um, but I, I guess, you know, and for us, then, our, my uh, population is adults. And what I see is overwhelming with the individuals being released from prison, with the indigent population in Champaign, which I'm sure that we're not even touching the surface on at this moment. Uh, but we have somewhere between 250 and 300 people in and out of our office every month. And um, I'm sure that's still not even touching the... So I'll shush and see if... And have you answer some of those, if you can even figure out what I asked. No, it was... Who's going first or should I? Yeah. You go first. Okay. Well, I have a couple thoughts I'll say okay. for you. Um, Maybe all of his thoughts will invalidate all of mine. I'm not sure. But, um, but I'll still take the chance. Um, I guess I guess several you know several things that I'm thinking about. First, in terms of have we set a priority for children over adults, over seniors, over whatever? 
No, because I think most of us who are in the position of receiving people who are in need can't say yes, you, and no, not you. And we also know that children live in families. Right. And, you know, that, that there are working adults. And, and why we have such a high rate of uninsurance in our community, I think it's all the reasons that Jeff talked about. But I think the other thing that we need to understand, and actually healthcare consumers released a study about this back in 2000. And we haven't done it again because not that much has changed. But we actually did a study about our community's risk for uninsurance, looking at, it at, looking at the risk at a community level because there are factors that are known to play into high uninsurance rates within communities. And one of the factors is the employment base and having a, you know, um, a big number of small employers. And we have, although we have some major employers, we have a big number of small employers who are not being able to afford you know, health insurance for their employees. So that's a huge factor. So we have our local economic employment base that's part of the, the equation. So a lot of the folks without insurance are working folks um, as well. Um, but that's just sort of background. But in terms of priorities, uh, you know, one of the reasons that we, you know, that we brought Tom and that we wanted to learn more about this is because at our, at our first meeting, we had thought, oh, God, okay, well, this, you know, these changes in reimbursement and, and the rapid reimbursement for these services, these might become incentives for the clinics to start opening their doors a little bit more for these particular services, for these particular children. That might ease the strain, you know, on some of the other providers, you know, who are still having to deal with adults, with children who have other needs, with seniors, and so on. Um, but we never intended to focus on children to the exclusion of others. Um, you know, so I think, you know, one of the questions that comes to mind, and we have folks, a couple folks here from the clinics, and I certainly don't want to um, put them on the spot, but I also don't want to, um, you know, um, stop you from saying something if you want to speak. But, um, but I think, you know, the thoughts that come to my mind is, you know, given what we've learned, you know, and hopefully the folks who are here from the clinics are going to are working with the clinics, and we'll go back and talk to them. But I think a next conversation that would make sense. Um, I mean, I think it should happen internal to the clinics, and then it should happen between all of us. Is are the clinics aware of this, and are they going to? You know, might they make some changes to their policy based on this, and that might open up access for children in some ways. Um, I think another thing that comes to my mind is um, that has been actually very enlightening having Tom here is thinking about you know talking to the state and um, we have tried to talk to them I don't get my calls returned <laughs> um, you know maybe now they'll start to get returned and with some help from some folks but I think it makes sense that when we ask to speak to the state that first we ask to speak to the clinics and we say you know here's a strategy we're thinking about we'd like to go to the state um, and I think the state would be much more likely to listen to us if the clinics are with us. You know, and what a huge power base when the clinics have over 90% of all the docs in this community. I mean, we can figure out how to attract other docs to this community, but unless we have FQHCs and build a whole other clinic, um, the crisis is going to persist for a, you know, a very long time. And um, this community actually has a good track record of figuring out how to solve some problems. We have this child dental access program um, through the county where um, we, and I know this isn't the solution for this problem with primary health care, but with, with the dental problem, you know, the county board and the county board of health said, we will fund dental care for children um, if the dentists are willing to be reimbursed, you know, at 50% of their usual charges, so it's better than what Medicaid was paying and we'll reimburse them within like two weeks of them submitting the bill. And the children will get care for free, but the county, you know, will, will be billed through this program or whatever. We, had, we were at a crossroads. The crisis was so bad for county children because they really didn't have access to dental care. We were at a crossroads, and one of the options was we can go after the dentist for not taking Medicaid because most of those kids are Medicaid beneficiaries. We can go after them. But we knew, although it's not litigation, we knew that that would be a protracted battle. We would make enemies. It would take a long time. And meanwhile, we have two-year-olds in this county who need root canals. And so we talked to the dentist. What's the problem? 
And it's not just about the low reimbursement, it's about the very, very slow reimbursement. So we came up with the model. Um, you know, and I'm not saying that's the model for our primary health care issue, but in terms of the collaborating and working with the dentists, or in this case, the clinics, you know, I, that feels to me like from this discussion that that is the way to go, is to engage the clinics. And hopefully the folks who are here from the clinics, you know, we can follow up separately. I don't want to put you on the spot at all. But maybe, you know, um, you know, if that's a way of doing it, and maybe also part of it, I also feel like, um, and this is just me, this is um, Claudia Lindhoff from Champaign County Healthcare Consumer, so I'm not speaking on behalf of the group, but my sense also is that we've got to find a way in the meantime, as we're working collaboratively for the long-term solution, we've got to find a way to open up access a little bit more. We keep hearing about the importance of Francis Nelson needing the Medicaid patients because Francis Nelson gets a higher Medicaid reimbursement than the clinics do. But Francis Nelson is federally funded, and they can't tell uninsured patients, no, we won't see you because we got to let in Medicaid because they pay us better. They can't do that, you know, because of their federal funding. So maybe one thing to do is, while we're working on the longer term solution is, you know, let's find a way of screening and having the clinics start opening their doors a little bit more to uninsured folks. Um, and ease the strain on Francis Nelson so that they can get more Medicaid folks, get the higher reimbursement, build themselves up, you know, move on and, and things like that. And remember also, we're going to have families where the kids have Medicaid or have some kind of insurance and the adults don't, you know, but, you know, everybody in the family needs a medical home. So those are just sort of my thoughts as I'm, you know, hearing this and hopefully the folks here from the clinics, you know, we can talk later or you can see if that sounds like, you know, something worth checking out or, or pursuing, but it feels to me like <coughs> talking to the state is a good idea, but it would, I think we would be so much stronger with the clinics with us. I agree. Let me just add two thoughts to that. I mean, I guess if I reached, I, I, you reached out to the clinics, the, the, the one thing I might say to them is, is that we don't want you to take kids only. We would like you to commit to taking families. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And treat them like family units. Yeah. I mean, the literature shows that kids are go to the doctor far more often when Parents have, are at the same place, they have a yeah. medical home. Uh, as I understand these clinics, they could have an internist and a pediatrician, yeah. for example, right. at the same place or something like that, to reach out and, and say that they would take a certain number of families. Now, the other thing that I was saying, you guys may have already done this, so shut me up if I know, is that what we find in Cook County and what the state, in interest of the found when they roll out all kids, is that they're assuming that a big chunk of the folks that they enroll, that they enroll in all kids will do Medicaid kid care eligible, mm -hmm. which means that they'll be able to take a federal match on those kids because mm -hmm. the sense is that there's a lot of under enrollment and we've also seen an expansion of family care which covers parents mm -hmm. and so it might be the right time to, to, to do a push and this is um, working as a group, working with the townships to try to help identify people who could be eligible for Medicaid and get them enrolled. The good thing for them is, okay, they have some coverage. It's not as good as private health insurance, but it's better than being uninsured. And the other thing about it is, is as health care is provided, we get to reach out to the federal government for 50% or 65% of those costs. The other thing that I would say about the townships, and we have worked with the townships in the past and found them very <coughs> sympathetic to this, is that we think, at least for persons with disabilities, that the state has the system way too tight for finding people disabled to qualify for Medicaid. It takes forever. There are huge delays at the client assessment unit, and they do a really crappy job of making decisions. And they deny a lot of people who should be on because of their health care problems. And this is a fight that we've pushed um, in the past. But I think there needs to be, and this is something I would be more than willing to stay involved with, is this campaign to get the state to find more people disabled and eligible for Medicaid because they can get their match for it. A lot of these folks are putting on TA Medical, at least in Cook County, and I think down we here as well. That. You don't have that down here, but we have it in Cook County where the state's paying state dollars, 100%, to provide care for those folks and they could be taking a match on them if they would just find them disabled. Mm -hmm. Or the state could go back to what they used to do, which was to have a presumptive disability program, the old D3 program, where people who were seeking Social Security benefits or SSI benefits could be found probably disabled, given a medical card, while that Social Security application is pending. It allows them to access health care 
And what usually happens then is they finally have the records they need to prove that they're disabled. I mean, these are people who aren't working anyway. They're out of the job market by and large, or they're so underemployed, they're working, you know, five to six hundred dollars a month of employment. That's not working. Um, and I think that's another thing. Now, there will be a lot of resistance from the state there. But I, my sense is, is that so there's two parts of that. Is let's find the people who qualify under the rules like they are now, and let's push the state to loosen those rules for persons with disabilities and get them off so that they have some source of payment. I, I think, and I'll give you an example for prisoners. Uh, right now, I think there should be a system so that they are presumptively entitling these folks when they come out with a medical card, particularly because I see client after client who has severe mental impairments coming out of prison who get a, what is it, 30 days? 30 day supply of meds. Adios. Then they run out and then they're getting arrested or they're going back into a state facility and it's costing a ton of money. Although it's coming out of a different line in state government, so it's hard to get cooperation. So there's lots of different things we could do there. And in fact, I'm going to give a presentation around Chicago talking about covering the uninsured and saying that one of the things we need to do is really, as a state, push Medicaid as far as we can to cover people. Because we're getting that 50% share from the feds anyway. These are not people who are going to qualify for private health insurance. A lot of them are not employable. Um, and we end up paying a lot more for them because we don't give them that kind of preventive care. The diabetic who can't get his insulin, the um, person with um, seizure disorder that can't get meds, the um, person who can't get antipsychotics, um, diabetes. I mean, the list just goes on and on. Now, that's a long range thing. That's something I've been fighting on for since 92. Um, have been incredibly unsuccessful, um, you know, at, at that. But there's lots of things we can do, but just pushing to get the people who qualify now to get on. And, and I think that's a joint effort as well. Um, and then you probably have to have, you have to bring in a different state agency, which is Department of Human Services, and talk about how you can get them to be players in this process as well. Um, yeah, it's a very difficult process to get them, for those who have been, a doctor has basically said, they can't work, or a mental health professional has said they're incapable of doing work. And the, it's long term trying to get them through um, denial, then the appeals. And I really think that, you, we, that we could get a lot of support. I don't know about Champaign County and townships, but I do think that there are townships out there who are acutely aware that the whole medical thing could take them out because of tax caps. And how do we make the SSI and the medical the uh, do what it is that it was intended to do? So I think that you would get a lot of support from the townships. Yeah, and I think a presumptive program like yes. we used to have would take a huge burden off the townships because right now they're basically running that presumptive program. Right. And that's not something that I see townships as particularly well suited to do. No. You have other things that you're supposed to do, right. yeah. um, I think, than right. doing that. Mm -hmm. That's really a state function and not a township That's function. That's right. Okay, how about one more comment and then we probably need to start to formally wrap up. I just wanted to say I really concur with your creative solutions, especially the idea about proposing a pilot project. Mm -hmm. I actually uh, sat on the telemedicine task force for Medicaid reimbursement in the state and uh, through rural involvement, rural hospitals got telemedicine reimbursement for um, specialists to see our folks and Medicaid to pay them. Uh, I know Carl's very progressive when it comes to that particular modality. I think Provena's had some interest in it too. Um, but I wanted to say that that also would be one avenue that might be worth exploring to extend the reach of providing um, some specialist consultation, at least, through the use of telemedicine with primary care provider at one of our uh, ancillary sites. And uh, I think the state is, was very open to looking at a pilot project, approved it, and, and uh, from our two county catchment area, extended it to the whole state as far as 
Thank you very much. Okay, um, thank you all very much for your um, participation. I want to go ahead and conclude us on time. People are welcome to um, stick around if you want afterwards. Um, in terms of uh, next steps, it sounds like, um, and, and please suggest something else if you have a definitive